Uh, my name is Martin Winslow, and I am the missions pastor for the Canaan campuses. Good to be with you here this morning. If you would, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Being the missions pastor, a couple of weeks ago at our Oakville campus, we had a commissioning service for about 17 of us that were headed to West Africa and Senegal. And uh, there was terrible weather in Chicago, and so our flight got uh, delayed over and over again. Six hours. We boarded the plane twice and deplaned a couple of different times. And it became pretty clear after a few hours that we were going to miss our flight to Brussels to connect. And um, so before I landed, I was talking to the travel agent. This was a couple weeks ago. And I, uh, I said, Hey, what are the chances of rebooking this? And it looked like they could get us out in three different sections, but the last group would arrive in Africa on Tuesday and we'd have to fly out Friday. So had to cancel the trip. We got stuck in Chicago. And so I was like, well, let's just try to make the best of this. And so we reached out to uh, some partners that we had through the North American Mission Board. And we did ministry in West Chicago, the West part, West Garfield. And I don't know if anybody's ever been in West Garfield in Chicago, but gunshots are frequent and uh, it's dangerous. I had a group of teenagers there with me as we did ministry to the homeless and By God's grace, some really cool things happened, and we all came back home in one piece, but definitely a dangerous city that needs the Lord. And God is sovereign, right, in our plans, even though we can't see what He's doing. Who knows what He saved us from? And two, uh, but one of the cool things we were going to do when we were in West Africa was um, we'd had a gentleman come in our church that knew we had a deaf school, Bethlehem Christian Academy, which I founded 15 years ago with some partners. We had uh, a school in West Africa that ministers to the deaf. And so we had 30 kids in that deaf school. And a gentleman came to me and said, have those kids ever been tested to he- to see if they can hear with like hearing aids? And so I said, not to my knowledge. So we sent our school to Dakar and we found out that 10 of our kids with hearing aids are going to be able to hear. Is that awesome? So we praise God for that. And pretty soon there's going to be like concrete ways. This gentleman, he said, listen, I'd love to pay for some of those hearing aids for those kids. So they're getting another thing called an audiogram. I don't know how it all works, but we're going to have some footage and some video. And so when it's all done, I'd love to show, to have Kevin and Justin show that video to show you what we're doing in West Africa. But you all can be a part of that in the future as well. So in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we continue our series today talking about David, and today's title is Worshipper. David was a prolific poet, writing many of the Psalms, prayers, and worship songs to God. David also worshiped with his life and leadership, showing us that worship is tied to work both in our failures and in our successes. You might call it a meteoric rise of David. That's what we see in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel. In fact, it reminded me this morning, I am a big NBA fan. I have been for years since the Michael Jordan days. I used to watch him whenever I was a kid in high school. But in 2012, there was this this really cool story that happened. There was this Chinese kid who came from LA that was undrafted, but got a chance to play for the New York Knicks, but he sat on the bench. He was the fourth point guard on their roster, and he was the last point guard. No one thought he could really play. He'd been sent to the developmental league a few times, uh, but nobody really thought he was that much. And what happened is the Knicks thought, well, this is our year to really do well. They had some great players on their team, Amare Stoudemire. They had Carmelo Anthony, but the point guard position was key. Well, their first two point guards got injured, and then their third point guard came in, and he ended up injured. And so this kid named Jeremy Lin, got an opportunity to play. And if you know anything about the 2012 Knicks, it became a time known as Lin Sanity. This Chinese kid that nobody knew that was last on the bench, no one thought he could really play, came in and he led the Knicks all the way to the playoffs. He was incredible and he seemed to be out of nowhere. He was scoring buckets and he was just getting assists. He was an amazing point guard. And that was really the time that people began to see that, my goodness, this kid can really play. And it changed the whole trajectory of his career. He went from a bench setter to getting in the game. Same thing with David, right? We've seen David who, uh, you know, Samuel comes and he comes to Jesse in first Samuel chapter 16. He's looking for that next king. All of the sons of Jesse pass in front of Samuel and Samuel's like, 
Is that all your kids? Right? He said, well, there's one more. But he, he's thinking, it can't be him. But let me call him. And David comes out of the field from tending the sheep. And Samuel says, that's the guy. Linsanity, right? And then we see this rise of humility. He won't lift his hand against the king. David does things right in 1 Samuel. He's got a great friendship with Jonathan, the son of the king. He will not usurp the authority of the Lord's anointed. He does these great heroic things against Goliath. He kills Goliath in chapter 17. We think he's not even 20 years old yet when he does that. He does all these amazing things in 1 Samuel. And in 2 Samuel, we begin to see him make several mistakes. And one of those mistakes is today in 2 Samuel chapter 6. But he has a story that is really kind of a Cinderella story. You might call it, I, I refer to these things as like a Davidic story. He came out of nowhere and God used him for great things. The ark of God had been in Shiloh for 369 years after it arrived in the Holy Land. It came into the Holy Land during the time of the judges, but it was temporarily stored in Shiloh. After the Philistines stole it and then returned it to the Israelites, uh, remember that they returned it on the back of an ox cart. That'll come into play today, a little bit later. It was returned to the Israelites, but it never found its home again in Shiloh. And eventually what David did is, after he conquered the Jebusites in the city of, of Jerusalem, he decided this is going to be the place where our king is going to be enthroned. And that's what we're reading about today. Here's our big thought for today. As this ark is going to be enthroned in Jerusalem, listen carefully, our good intentions are not the same thing as obedience. You know, if you ever get pulled over by a police officer for speeding, right? And you just say, well, I, I had good intentions. What's he going to tell you, right? Your good intentions don't really get you anywhere. Our good intentions are not the same thing as obedience. When we stray from God's plan or seek to add to it, there can be major consequences. We're going to see that today. However, when we obey the Lord, he is honored and we are joyful. We're going to read 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 23. It's a long text. If you're able to stand, go ahead and stand. And we're going to read this together this morning and take apart 2 Samuel chapter 6 and learn about the difference between good intentions and obedience. Now, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts. Notice this, who is enthroned above the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. Verse 4, so they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood and with lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. So you got the picture in your mind, right? The, the ox cart gets unsteady, the ark starts to fall over, and Uzzah is going to steady the ark. Verse 7, And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah and struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. So David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? And David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Thus, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. Notice what happened. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Verse 12, 
Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. David went. I mean, you know, he's getting blessed. It's like, well, maybe it's time for me to be blessed, right? That was supposed to be funny. David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Verse 13. And so it was that when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. So they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place inside the tent which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Further, he distributed to all the people, to all the multitude of Israel, both to men and women, a cake of bread and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed each to his house. But when David returned to bless his household, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servants, maids, as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me <clears throat> above your father and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord of Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord. Verse 22. I will be more lightly esteemed than this and will be humble in my own eyes. But with the maids of whom you have spoken... With them I will be distinguished. Verse 23, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this great narrative that tells us and teaches us about mistakes, about following those up with obedience, also about shamelessly worshiping you. We live in a culture today, much of which hates the gospel and hates the gospel truth. And Lord, many times we shy away from being open about who Jesus is. Lord, may we be bold like David, without shame, standing for what the truth is, loving you like we should, and sharing that good news of the gospel with the lost in this world. We pray that today you would teach us from your word, that we would be humble, that we would listen carefully, that you would bless your people that each one of us would walk away from here different today because of the power of your spirit. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, what a crazy story, right? You know, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, we see as David is going to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem and enthrone God over the people, we see his good intentions. He has good intentions. But no matter how good our intentions are, if they're not coupled with obedience, those good intentions are worthless. Now, I want to tell you the honest truth. I struggled with this story as a young man. Here's this guy, Uzzah, you know? Uzzah's probably like me. He's like, oh, you know, the, I, I, I'm a helper, and, and here this, you know, the ark is getting ready to fall over. I'm just going to reach out and steady that. Seems like a good thing, right? What's the problem here? Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God, took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. God struck him down there because of his error and he died there beside the ark. No doubt Uzzah had great intentions, but the setup for David's party to bring the ark into Jerusalem was actually a party of disobedience. Obedience is such a key theme in First and Second Samuel. We see this from the very beginning, that God wants obedience. In fact, you remember that Samuel said to Saul, obedience is better than what? Sacrifice. We learned in First Samuel at the death of Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, we went on to see that Saul many times had good intentions but only offended the Lord of hosts. He was specifically instructed at one point, you remember, to destroy all of the Amalekites. 
But after the battle, listen to this discourse between Saul and Samuel. Again, Saul had good intentions, but they're not the same thing as obedience. Okay? We're going to get down to the relevancy of that for us here in just a few minutes. Listen to this discourse. And Saul said to Samuel, this is after the battle with the Amalekites, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil and the sheep and the oxen, the best things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord our God at Gilgal. And Samuel said this, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying his voice? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the Lord and the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king, right? This is a theme that we've seen in 1 Samuel. And now here we are in 2 Samuel, and David does something pretty foolish here at the very beginning. David, with good intentions in our narrative today, wants to celebrate the Ark of God coming into Jerusalem. It's now called the city of David. He wants to recognize the true king of Israel is Yahweh, and that Yahweh is on his throne. And look, he's now in this holy city, and he's over all of these people. He is wanting to enthrone Yahweh. In fact, listen carefully to verse 2 again. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, listen, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. You remember the cherubim are the angels from both sides of the ark, and their, their wings kind of came up in this shape. And on top was that place called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is where the invisible God, Yahweh, was actually enthroned. So David now in this enthronement ceremony brings Yahweh, right? And his ark, his mercy seat, where he sits into Jerusalem. He's going to enthrone Yahweh. However, these good intentions were not coupled with biblical obedience, First of all, we have to remind ourselves and set the stage for what the Ark of the Covenant is up to this point. And this is what I mean. He's not obedient. If you remember, you got to think back. Where did the Ark come from? The children of Israel have been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. They leave, they come to the foot of Mount Sinai, and God gives his revelation to them. Not only does he give them the Ten Commandments, but he gives them all kinds of commands about how they're to live with one another when they eventually get into the Holy Land. You remember? That's what the law is given for, is to a new people who will inherit a land, and that's how they're to operate among themselves. The chief commandments, of course, are the ten, but there's all kinds of interrelational commandments that were given as well. Along with that, God, knowing that this is a bunch of sinners, had to provide a way for the covenant that he had made with them to be maintained. So to have covenantal maintenance, there needs to be ongoing sacrifice. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, right? So that's why the tabernacle was set up. So that they could sacrifice before their king. And they could maintain the covenant. So the sacrificial system became a way of covenantal maintenance, right? God's keeping his part of the deal, but the people continually fail Sacrificial system comes in between them and allows them to keep a relationship with God. So the tabernacle was that place called the holy place, right? Only the priest could walk into the holy place. And the interesting thing about the tabernacle, as you got closer and closer to the presence of God where he was enthroned on the ark, the metals around it got more precious. It starts in the holy place in that big courtyard with bronze things. And then once you get into the holy place, you walk inside to the tent of meeting, things are made out of silver. And as you get closer to where Yahweh is enthroned, things are made out of gold, right? And so the ark is actually behind a curtain. Now keep in mind what's going on here with Uzzah in this celebration. The ark is actually behind a curtain. 
And the ark is a place where only the high priest is able to go in once a year. You remember this? On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And on that day, it's a very sacred day. Before he comes before the ark, Okay? He has to make a sacrifice for himself, not just the people to intercede for them, but for himself. And he's got to take some of that blood, put it on his right thumb, his right earlobe, his right toe, There's his right big toe. I mean, there's all this intricate stuff about obedience before he goes in there. Something else that you need to know is that the high priest's garment, around the hem of his garment, had little bells around it. Because as he would walk, you could hear him walking and moving. If you go behind that curtain unworthily, and the bells stop ringing. What does that mean when he comes into the presence of the Lord and you don't hear any bells anymore? He might be dead. Because if he goes in there unworthily, he dies. In fact, tradition tells us that they were so fearful of coming before the ark and the mercy seat to offer the blood just once a year that they would tie a rope around the high priest's leg. And if the bells stop, he'd get yanked from underneath the curtain. Now... Almost a thousand years later, what's David doing with the ark? Yeah, I put it on a new ox cart and brought it into Jerusalem. He's not following the ways God told him to take care of the ark. And we're going to see that. The ark is where Yahweh's enthroned. He's holy. He's not to be trifled with. In Exodus chapter 25, it tells us how to handle the ark. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. I think we've got a picture. Do we have that picture? Yeah, so here's a picture. You've probably seen this before, right? This is how the ark was to be handled. What did David do? Well, he took a lesson from the Philistines. When the Philistines all got sick from having the ark inside Philistia in 1 Samuel, and they got scared of it and they were breaking out in tumors and stuff, they stuck the ark on an ox cart and sent it back to Israel. We don't want this thing anymore. But David, he was going to put it on a new ox cart. But see, this is how the ark was to be handled. And above those angels is where the mercy seat was and where Yahweh was enthroned. David no doubt had good intentions, but are good intentions and obedience the same thing? No, they're not the same thing. Now, if you've got children at home, a lot of times our children have good intentions, right? But we all know good intentions and obedience are not the same thing. When they're hooked up playing games and you're like, hey, I need you to clean your room, right? Well, I got distracted. Well, that sounds like those are good intentions. But what do good intentions get us? Nothing. Nothing, right? We have to obey. David is not obeying the voice of the Lord. The ark isn't supposed to be riding in the back of an ox cart, no matter if the ox cart is new or not. The point is that David wasn't obedient to the clear teachings of scriptures, which he knew. He knew how sacred the ark was. You remember the sons of Aaron who offered strange fire before the ark? What happened to them? They were consumed. Like these stories were passed down. They weren't just stories. They were the story of Israel, his people. And he wasn't being careful with God. The directions had been carefully laid out by the Lord, and David decided that he was going to make the celebration better. I'm going to make the celebration better, just like Saul. Well, I didn't wipe out the Amalekites. I wanted to make the celebration for Yahweh better. I, I brought these, these things all back, Lord, to sacrifice for you. To obey is better than to sacrifice. That's what we have to understand as God's people. It's so critical, isn't it? You remember the story in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talks about if you've got something against your brother, what's he say to do? He says, first, go make it right with your brother before you bring your offering. To obey is better than to sacrifice. Does he need our money? No. Does he need our celebrations? No. But he desires our obedience. And when we obey, all those things follow. Amen? You remember it wasn't too long ago, just to set the stage, because when I was a kid, I really struggled with this Uzzah thing. Uzzah's just a guy trying to help out, right? It was not too long ago we were studying Esther, 
we had an Esther series and we talked about the throne room of Xerxes. Now think about it. You couldn't even casually walk into the throne room of Xerxes, okay? If you casually walked into the throne room of Xerxes and he looks at you and he doesn't extend the scepter, what happens? Uzzah went beyond that. Now imagine if you presumptuously walked up to Xerxes' throne, which you couldn't have done in Persia because the immortals surrounded it, his secret service agents, and they would have cut you down. But if you presumptuously walked up there and, ma- and you just touched the throne, what do you think would happen in ancient Persia? You'd be killed. This is actually, that's just a man who thinks he's a god. This is the god of the universe. This is where he sits. He is holy. He's not to be trifled with. He's not your homeboy. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is God. And if Xerxes would have you killed, it makes sense to me that if you touch it, you're going to be in some big trouble. We cannot improve upon the plans of the Lord. We learn that in this text. David decided himself how the enthronement of Yahweh would happen in Jerusalem. I'm sure they had a committee that they formed, and they decided how it would be done, what songs would be played, what dances would happen, where the new ox cart would be built. And David's going to like create this incredible moment for Yahweh. But one thing he didn't take into consideration was the word of God first. That had to be primary in his life. So the committee should have started with, you know what, maybe we should look back to Exodus. Maybe we should think of what happened to Hophni and Phinehas. Maybe the sons of Aaron, there's a lesson to be learned, right? But he didn't start that way. He decided, him and his little group, that they were going to have a big celebration for the Lord. We'll really honor God. But that's not what God wanted. God wanted to be obeyed, and that is how he is honored. You know, I mean, just in a practical way, this you think about it, like when people make assumptions or assume things, they do things that are presumptuous, it kind of drives us all crazy, right, in a general way. There was this guy in Lexington, Missouri one time when I lived there. I was a youth pastor there. I was just getting started. Amy and I didn't have much money. And I just needed an oil change. And so I took my car down to the filling station there. And I was like, hey, uh, you know, I just need an oil change. And the guy's like, yeah, sure. Let me just fill this out. What year's your car? All the stuff, you know, it just got there. He says, I'll call you back in the afternoon. So he calls me back and I go in to pay the bill. And he's like, he gives me this astronomical number. And I was like, wait a minute. What'd you do to my car? He's like, well, I noticed you needed some new windshield wipers. I noticed you needed an air filter, and I noticed this, and I noticed that, and I, so I just changed it all. I was like, no. You remember this? I was like, Take the, give me my old wipers back. That's not, I don't have the money to pay for that, right? Has anybody ever had a situation like that where somebody's just presumptuous like that? And I was like, no, don't look at my brakes. Don't do anything. I told you to change the oil. Call me next time before you start putting new parts on. I don't want an old air. The air filter is probably the new one's worth more than my car. Don't do that. You know what I'm saying? It was a clunker. So I'm just saying like, we can't improve upon the plan that the owner had. Don't try to improve upon his plans. And sometimes we get in the flesh and start thinking, well, I can make the message better. I'm going to soft serve it here or there. No, the owner of the manual, right? The owner of the scriptures, the God of the Bible, he tells us how to do these things. And we can't make it better. We just need to obey it. We live in a culture that constantly tries to improve upon what God has said. There are two genders. Our culture tells us today there are countless genders. They're still counting them. They're they're materializing out of their minds what a gender is. And the number gets greater and greater and greater all the time because, because God's not God. Man is God. And man gets to decide and make the rules. And as he makes the rules, things begin to spin out of control. What happens is we end up moving towards entropy, not towards order. There are also no non-binary reality anymore. We have people who are transgenders. They can move between tr- genders. It's, we're gender fluid in our society today. This is what our culture tells us. 
All of this, of course, trying to add to or improve upon the plan of the Lord. It leads to a culture of chaos, and it also leads to people never feeling whole. It robs the person of who God made them to be. The biggest scandal is that the culture is giving the voice to this, and it's making people worse and further away from the Lord, not closer to reality, but further removed from reality because they try to they try to improve upon what God has said and it leaves people empty. It leaves people depressed. It leaves people with mental health issues. It doesn't help to solve anything. We can't improve upon the plans of the Lord. The culture can't improve upon the plans of the Lord. The place where truth and comfort comes is from obeying the voice of the Lord. He wrote the board game. If you get outside of those rules, you move outside of those guardrails, you're going to crash and burn. You know, it's not just the culture that does it. We do it as well within the church. It's not just the world that tries to improve upon what God says many times, but it's us. We try to put a little bit of flesh into the gospel to make it more palatable for those around us. Again, we try to soft serve it because after all, I'm related to this person or I've had a relationship for so long and I'm afraid I'm going to break it. And if I break it, then I'll ne never have an opening again. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm constantly leaving this fear and this tension and I'm not just saying what God told me to say in the scriptures. Obviously in kindness, Peter says to every man an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within in humility and reverence. Of course, humility and reverence are a part of that. But to every man an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within us. We try to put a little bit of flesh into the gospel, leave out elements like hell, judgment, not talk too much about sin or righteousness or the blood or the cross or the very central elements of what the gospel is anyway. Amen? That's the gospel. It's messy. Somebody got killed, right? But all of these issues, when clearly talked about, help us to know the plan of God. We also must learn in this text that good intentions are not the same thing as obedience. How many times in our Christian lives do we fool ourselves into thinking that good intentions are the same thing as obedience. The God-man clearly tells us that once we become a disciple, we're to be baptized. We have every intention of doing it someday, but just continue to disobey the voice of the Lord. Good intentions are not obedience. One day I'm going to start a Bible reading plan. Anybody ever had those good intentions? One day I'm going to really get serious about the hard work of prayer. Good intentions. One day, I'm going to make a kingdom sacrifice with my money. One day, I'm going to take the time to go on a short-term mission trip. I feel like God's given me this stirring for a while. But I've never done it. One day, I'm going to share the gospel with my neighbor. One day, with my coworker. One day, with my friend. One day, with my family member. One day, right? Good intentions. We've all got them. Ugh. But they're not the same thing as obedience. We'd all be good to remember this saying. Are you ready? Delayed obedience is disobedience. I don't think I heard an amen in the place. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Got one more try. One more try. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Amen. Yeah, it's hard to say it. Good intentions, we might even call them great intentions, are not the same thing as obeying the voice of the Lord. Today, the scriptures remind us that careful attention to what God has revealed to us and our corresponding obedience is key for relationship, right? Paul Tripp says, if good theology does not result in radical changes in life, it's actually bad theology. Good theology drives us away from the self, right? away from the self, and toward God. It helps us to know that on our own, we stray from truth. Good theology drives and moves us toward the revealed word of God. The story of Uzzah today 
and David is a stern reminder of the holiness and righteousness of God. When David tried to improve upon the plans of the Lord, Uzzah was struck down. Everyone always asks this question, how could God do that to Uzzah? But after I've set the stage from Exodus forward, a better question would be, how could God not have done that to Uzzah? Amen? God is holy, not to be trifled with. And by the way, no one gets surprised when a snake handler gets bit by a cobra and dies, right? That's just kind of cause and effect. You've been told, don't touch that ark. What Uzzah should have been doing in that ox cart was getting in the corner as far away as he could have. Or maybe he should have stopped the whole ceremony and said, you know what? I got a better idea. Let's carry this thing the way the Lord told us to do it. To obey is better than to sacrifice. You touch the ark, you're toast. Uzzah's disobedience was a picture of David trying to be the true king of Israel. It was David doing things his own way, but God gives David a second chance to do it the way he wants it to. So 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 15, now we move towards the 2.0, the good obedience. Things are different now when he brings the ark into Jerusalem. Our good intentions must be followed up with obedience. In the second attempt to bring the ark into Jerusalem, it's done in an obedient way. The ark is taken seriously. The cherubim that lead to the enthronement of God upon the mercy seat, it's serious. David slows down and thoughtfully has the ark carried into the holy city. The true worshiper doesn't just have good intentions. The true worshiper obeys the voice of the Lord. We must slow down, not be presumptuous, but listen carefully to the word of the Lord. God, I'm going to stop cussing. I, I have these intentions, but I never actually make a plan and beg for mercy to stop using foul language. God, I'm going to stop looking at pornography, but I never make that, uh, it, that intentional move towards what does the word of God say about that Holy Spirit drive me away from these things. But instead, I just always have good intentions. Second Samuel chapter 6, verses 16 through 23, we see David now in this obedient stage, worshiping before God without the fear of man. It was customary for bands of women to meet warriors on their return home with music and dancing, one leading the rest as Miriam also did before the Lord as a man of war. On this occasion, though, David himself acted as the leader in this celebration before God. It was definitely out of the ordinary. He laid aside his kingly attire, and the assumption of this light tunic was unquestionably done as an act of religious homage, his attitude and his dress being symbolic of his humility before God. So now things change in this 2.0. What does the scripture say? We're going to actually carry this thing in the way we were supposed to, there's an animal that's sacrificed every like six paces. I'm going to show in this act of humility, I'm going to take most of my clothing off and I'm going to be the guy that dances before the ark. David humbled himself and he did things right the second time. Didn't work out too good for Uzzah, but it's going to work out for David the second time. What we see this second time is penitence, joy, thankfulness, and devotion. When we worship the Lord, we also learn there will be persecution. I'm moving along fast here because I'm a little bit over time. Michael, David's wife, hated what David did. The world will always hate, listen, the world will always hate, and sometimes people in the church, that's the worst part, they will hate fully devoted worship to God. People in the world, and many times, you know how many times I hear these young people? I mean, I, I work with them and I send them abroad many times, but do you know how many times, and it's funny, I'll look, I'll look back at missionaries, but I hear these parents are telling their kids, don't go overseas. Don't go on mission. Stay here where it's safe. And then I go back and I look at the stories of like William Carey and all these other guys before, and it's always been that way. Everybody wants everybody to be safe instead of to obey. It's just kind of like ingrained within us that our first allegiance is to self and the preservation of the self and not to God, right? We've got to get over that. We've got to let go and be obedient. The world will hate full devotion to God. It will always cause you problems. So you and I should expect it, but God can use it 
for amazing things. I'm going to end with a story here this morning since I'm two minutes over time. There's a great book if you've never read it. It's called The Insanity of God. Has anybody read that book? Oh, it's wonderful. Stories about missionaries, evangelists, pastors around the world, and the things that they've went through, the persecution they've endured for the Lord when they have been obedient. And there's a story that's told in the insanity of God about a guy named Dimitri who was a believer. He was ripped out of his house, taken a thousand kilometers away from his family and imprisoned simply for being a proclaimer of the gospel. This was in Russia. So he's away from his family. He's put inside this prison cell that it's so tight where the bed is at. If you get out and you move one direction, you're at the sink. If you get out and you move the other direction, you're at the sink and the toilet. The other direction is you're at the door. So there's this much room. He's in that prison for 17 years. He's tortured. He's told to deny Jesus and he never does it. And he does one thing. He keeps one discipline alive his whole life. That's really cool. That he said he learned from his father. Every morning at sunrise, he would stand up inside of his cell at sunrise. He would point towards the east and he would sing a Christian song from his heart. The same song every morning of praise to Jesus. This is so cool. Well, the other prisoners, there were 1,500 1500 other prisoners and he thinks he was the only believer in that whole jail. They would throw food at his jail cell. They would make noise, tell him to stop singing. This went on every morning for like 17 years. The guy endured torture and everything else. And he's by, But every morning he would sing that song to Jesus, right? So one morning after 17 years, the guards, after hearing him sing it, pull him out and they're dragging him down the middle of the jail, taking him out to the courtyard where execution happens. And as they're pulling him, Out that door, everybody in the jail stands up and begins to sing Dimitri's song. 1,500 people. And Dimitri said it sounded like a choir from heaven. And these men jumped away from him and said, who are you? He said, he stood up, he looked him in the eyes and he said, I am a son of the living God. And they put him back in his jail cell. And a little bit while after that, Dimitri was released. But God, in that moment, all those years of obedience had showed himself to be the true God he said he was. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for these reminders about obedience and how important it is. Not just good intentions, but Jesus, you want us to obey. Give us the power and the strength to do that. I think of 1 Samuel chapter 16, when the spirit rushed upon David, would your spirit rush upon each one of us today? Help us with our eyes, help us with our heart, with our mind to not walk in the flesh, but to walk in the spirit. Lord, as we open this altar for a time of prayer and response, would you draw us to yourself? Help us to be humble. Help us to be careful with your word, to listen to it to not let elements of the flesh add in, but to be completely and totally sold out to you like Dimitri. I love you, God, as we enter a time of reflection and prayer. We pray for your Holy Spirit to work in this place. So the altar is now open. We pray, Lord, that you would work in your people in Jesus' name.